Okay. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love and who does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother, he is a liar, for he, does not, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So this is... Uh, all about love and so it's important to understand what John means by by the word love of course this is agape love that he's talking about and uh, if you've uh, read some writers like C.S. Lewis and other other writers as well distinguish different kinds of love uh, in the Greek language uh, and, you know, the first kind, of course, is eros, which is physical love, uh, and, and I don't think I need to explain that uh, much further. That's sort of uh, obvious, the attraction of men and women to each other, and, uh, and marital love, generally. Uh, and then the second kind uh, is called storge, uh, and which isn't often used in the New Testament, but it refers to the kind of love that family members have for one another. It's still love at a, uh, at a flesh level, at a soul level, the attachments that people feel for brothers and sisters and family or cousins, the grandparents, and the kind of affection that people uh, generally have though, of course, not always. Uh, and uh, the third kind is, is phileo or philia, which is friendship love uh, and the love of friends. Uh, and what philia and storge have in common is that they are both on the soul level. They're both uh, feelings of affection with people that we identify in some way with. Uh, when I, uh, uh, you know, with my family, they're my own flesh, to use a biblical term. Uh, I'm related to them. Usually we have interests in common. It may not be, uh, you know, the kind of private interests like hobbies, but we have, uh, you know, as most families have economic interests in common, financial interests in common. Uh, and uh, they look out for one another because you identify more with your family than you would with a stranger. Uh, and you might use storge uh, to describe the love of one's country. You identify more with Americans or Canadians if you're from Canada than you do with other nations or uh, other nations which you are more like, like we might uh, 
most of us have Northern European backgrounds, uh, although Ashley has a Chinese background, we might identify more with those ethnic groups that we see are more like us, uh, rather than people that are more distant from us. And so soulish love usually is, is based on how closely I identify with other group of people, do what I see them as my own flesh, as my own kindred, like uh, uh, Paul describes his love for Israel in Romans nine. It's because they're his own flesh. They're you know they are the people that he is most closely related with to and identifies with, and and friendship. It's that same an extension of that same kind of love, except it extends to friends you identify with these people in terms of your interests your hobbies uh your uh political alignments or because you're of the same religion uh and so it's in a way it's an extension of the love for family and uh uh except it extends to interests uh agape love is something entirely different uh it is love on the spirit level and it's love of people uh, that with whom you may have absolutely nothing in common. Uh, it may be love of people, in fact, not only that you have nothing in common with, but who are determined to hurt you or harm you or would if they could. Uh, and that's why Jesus taught about loving your enemies and praying for those who despitefully use use you. Uh, and then uh, Paul talks about how while we were uh, still sinners and we were still enemies of God, that God sent his son to die for us uh, and to sacrifice himself even while we were enemies of him and hostile to God. And that takes love on a whole nother level. It's not because I have something in common with them. It's not because I'm like them. And so because I love myself, I can sort of extend that self-love to others, which is really what human love is. Human love is I just extend self-love and I love others who are like me. But when it comes to loving people who are absolutely not like me, I find I can't do it. It's not humanly possible. There's no fleshly capability to love people that I cannot see myself as being like in any way. Uh, and that's why when Norman went to Africa and he found that he just simply couldn't love the Africans, he just couldn't identify with them. And that was really God's blessing in disguise because uh, he came to an end of himself, the end of his fleshly body, soul capabilities, and phileo and storge uh, ran out on him. He couldn't, he couldn't extend it to the Africans. Uh, and uh, I think that God brings all of us to that point where we find God places people who are just simply unlovable from a human perspective in our lives and and puts us sometimes when we've been unlovable in the lives of others in order it, it gives them an opposite it, it it forces them to dig deeper to find a source beyond the human level uh, in order to love uh, and this is when norman discovered that that you know he he prayed to god to give him love and discovered that God didn't have any love to give him, that love was not a commodity or a possession that God had that he could dole out uh, on request, uh, that God, in fact, when he read in 1 John uh, in this chapter, God is love, that God is, he says, is an iser, not a hazard. He doesn't have love to give. He is love. And he is this kind of self-sacrificial love that is able to lay down its life for its enemies, uh, because that's precisely what Jesus did. He sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We who were the enemies of God and who hated God, even if we thought we loved God, uh, we really hated God. What we loved was really just an image of ourselves 
projected onto the universe. We really didn't love the living God apart from God. Only really God can love himself through us. Um, so uh, love is from God, as John says, and anyone who has uh, anyone who loves the way that God loves has to have been born of God, uh, has to have been born out of God's own nature and character and express God. And those are the only people who know God in verse seven are people that know this kind of self-sacrificial love uh, for one's enemies, for those who despitefully use you. And anyone who doesn't love in this way doesn't really know God. They just know they just know something they think to be God. I mean, the ancient world had, was full of gods, full of deities, uh, but none of them were really love. Zeus, the, the chief god of the Greeks, was not love. He was a god who went around raping women and casting down lightning bolts from the god when every, whenever anyone ticked him off. Uh, and that was their ideal of God, apparently. Uh, if any, any of the gods were their ideal, uh, Zeus would have been it. And any of the pagan deities, uh, the, the ancient Mesopotamians, uh, uh, where Abraham come fr came from, the gods decided to destroy humanity in the, with a flood. And this is their version of the flood story because humans had become too numerous and had become too noisy and they were irritating the gods. It wasn't because of human evil. It was because uh, there were too many of them and they were noisy. Uh, and that's why humanity was wiped out. And so that was their ideal of the gods is these, the, not a god of love, but a god of, uh, who, who is just easily roused to wrath or irritated. Um, but the god that we know of, that we have experienced, in it, it manifests his love among us in verse nine in sending his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him so that we might have real spiritual life eternal life through him so that we might not perish but have eternal life uh and uh and he sacrificed his own son on our behalf uh that we might have love uh, and it and this is love, not that we have loved God. It isn't that we started out loving God, as I mentioned before. We hated God. We were hostile. The mind of the flesh is enmity with God, is hatred towards God. Uh, and if we imagine that we loved God, we're indulging in a in a lie, in a satanic lie. Uh, no, the, the 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 thing is that He loved us. And he sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. And I know I've explained it before what, what an expiation is here uh, and why I don't think it's propitiation, but expiation, but I'm going to explain it again. Uh, propitiation, when you propitiate somebody, uh, you, you try to appease. They're angry at you and you try to appease them. Uh, and I was watching a uh, one of the FBI shows the other night, and someone was someone's home was invaded, and the the couple that was being tied up was trying to appease their attacker. Just take anything. Just give us our lives. You know, appeasing, trying to appease the wrath of this home invader by giving them anything that they wanted, as as long as they they weren't killed. Uh, and so propitiate has, has more to do with that. For example, uh, among the, what the ancient Greeks used to do when, uh, uh, if there was a plague, they'd try to propitiate the gods by offering sacrifices. And if animal sacrifices and sacrifices of money to the temple weren't sufficient, they would offer a human sacrifice and throw someone off a cliff to appease the deity that was offended in order to end the plague. And that's really the 
origin of propitiation is this someone is angry at you and you want to somehow offer some kind of valuable sacrifice so that it appeases their wrath and makes them not angry any, at you anymore. I don't really believe that this is what is going on in the Bible, that uh, there is, the Bible does talk about the wrath of God, uh, and certainly you could say that God is angry because of human sin, uh, and he's angry at human beings for sinning and for uh, allying themselves and allowing themselves to be joined to Satan. But the, the key thing in, in the atonement is not appeasing the anger of God. Rather, it's what God has done. God is angry that his vessels have been stolen by Satan. Uh, and what he wants to do is to correct the situation. The thing that's making him angry is his vessels have been defiled and misused by the devil. And so what he what expiation is, expiation is cleansing or washing. Uh, and what what the blood does is it acts like a detergent to cleanse the blood of the animals in the old covenant acted like a cleansing agent, a detergent to cleanse the temple from the, the sins of the people so that God could continue to dwell in the temple. And so God, it's not so much that God is commanding that the people offer some kind of sacrifice to appease him. No, he's commanding that blood be applied to the temple to cleanse what is causing the offense to God and driving God's presence out. And so the difference is more like... Uh, uh, how to, how to put it, uh, it, it, we as vessels, now we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and our temple has been defiled by the presence of Satan and by a sin consciousness, and so he, the, the Son is sent as an expiation for our sins to drive out and to cleanse us of guilt and to drive out the presence of Satan uh, from us. And that's an expiatory uh, sacrifice. He wants to, to cleanse what is causing the problem, not just deal with his anger. That's just a superficial, uh, because if, if all that God did was appease himself by punishing the son uh, and just left us in our present condition, then we would continue to commit the sins that made God angry in the first place. What God has to do is solve the problem by getting rid of the, th the sin that's causing the problem, the sin consciousness, which is cleansed by the blood, and by indwelling sin, he needs to get rid of the indweller that's causing the sins in the first place. And altogether, that's an expiatory sacrifice. It, it cleanses us from sins and from sin. So you see God, you see in propitiation, God is just raging mad at us and we offer a sacrifice to, uh, to somehow appease him and, and make, make him not angry at us. So God is the problem to be solved. But with expiation, we are the problem we're the cause of the problem, and God so loved us that he sent his son as a means to cleanse us and wash us and to drive out Satan from us. We're the problem that needs to be solved, or Satan in us is the problem that needs to be solved. So I think expiation goes way beyond mere propitiation. It's not just appeasing God. Uh, Yes, God's wrath is averted because the problem is dealt with, but it's not just us appeasing God. And so we see the depth of God's love, the extent to which he really loved us and sacrificed himself for us uh, by coming down as a human being, living among us, identifying with us, suffering with us, and then going to the cross and suffering the worst death imaginable, 
uh, even to the point of feeling utterly abandoned by God on the cross, though he wasn't actually abandoned by the Father, but in his soul, he felt like it. Uh, and he not only did that, but he took on this spirit of Satan that indwelt us, the spirit that's in the world, the spirit of the world, Satan himself, and took it on in his own flesh, not in his spirit, but in his flesh, so that when he died, the spirit of Satan would go out of us. And, that, and so he cleansed us from the indwelling sin, as well as our sin consciousness, our guilt. And so he loved us to that extent. There wasn't, it wasn't really about God being raging mad at us at all. That's what Satan wants to convince us of is, and, and really if, if we had angry fathers uh, may have convinced us that, oh, God is just like our raging father. No, God is nothing like that. That's Satan. I had really, it was the, the image of God I had for my father was really the image that Satan wanted me to ha have. That was the, the image of a uh, raging, condemning, uh, hateful, and I would do anything to appease to turn that wrath away. But that's a false view of God and why so many people str struggle with a view of God as a raging father that's a false view of God. No, that's really Satan that people have a view of. And the God that we worship and love and who loves us is the one who sacrificed himself for us in order to expiate our sins and to drive Satan out of us. So uh, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Now, of course, John doesn't mean here that we do this independently. It's not that uh, I, can, I have any capacity to love in this way uh, self-sacrificially of myself, and I certainly don't feel like it most of the time, if at all. Uh, but rather, you know, as, as Norman told Brian, you know, the oughts are there to be taken out. If God so loved, loved us, we do love one another. It's who we are. If we know who we are, we don't have to worry about fulfilling this command because his commands are easy. His commands are easy because he's the one doing the loving in us. He is love. We have to keep that in mind when we read John's oughts here, that he's the one who's doing the loving. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So we can't see God, but we can see love. We can see God in the love we have for one another. We're expressing God to one another. God is dwelling in us as we love, and his love is perfected. That is, is brought to completion by being manifested through us. That's what perfected means here. It's brought into outer manifestation. Uh, it's brought out into expression through us, because love that just remains in the spirit or in the heart isn't perfected because it's unexpressed, but it's perfected when it's expressed. Uh, and that doesn't mean we don't have to go around judging, well, is my love perfect or not? It's, well, do you express God's love? That, that's what perfected means here. It's completed by being manifested, by being expressed. And by this, we know that we remain or abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. He's, he's shed his, uh, he sheds his love abroad through the Holy Spirit in Romans 5, 5. And so we know we abide in him and he in us because his spirit produces that kind of love in us. It's the fruit of the spirit. It's not something produced by self-effort. It's the natural uh, result of, of being in the vine, of abiding in the vine, abiding in Jesus Christ. We're in union with him and we can't help but express the fruit of the spirit because it's who we are now. Because now we're in, in the true vine, the tree of life, and not in the false vine, the tree of knowledge, that is Satan's tree. Um, 
So we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So what he's saying here is we've seen and testify the Father has expressed his love for us by sending his Son to be our Savior, and indeed the Savior of the entire world if, if, if people receive him. I mean, every single person in the world would be saved if they received him individually. Uh, but of course, we know that doesn't happen, but uh, at least it's potentially possible. Uh, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. The confessing here is not just merely uh, saying that Jesus is the Son of God or intellectually believing that Jesus is the Son of God, but it's rather the, the expression of your heart. Uh, that, that Jesus really is the Son of God for you. Uh, and, and so for the person who really believes that Jesus is their Savior and the Son of God for them, then God abides in them and he in God. And we have come to know and rely upon, I like the NIV's translation there, on the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in self-sacrificial love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is love perfected and manifested in us so that we have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Because we love with his love and express that love in our actions, his love is completed in us, is perfected in us, and so we can be confident on the day of judgment that we will pass through with ease because, because we are him in our forms. He's expressed through us. His love is expressed through us and as us. As he is up in heaven, we are the same in this world. Uh, you know, go into the church and say that, well, you know, as Jesus is up in heaven, so am I in this world. You know, I see what kind of response you get. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Well, maybe Jesus is, is still a, is a sinner up in heaven, and that's why we're still sinners in this world. I don't think so. Uh, no, I believe that, as Paul says, when we were sinners, uh, and now we are saints, we are the holy ones of God, and we are perfected in love, and we do love with his love, and the Spirit does manifest his love as us. And John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Well, what kind of fear is he talking about here? Uh, it's talking about the fear of judgment, because he says fear has to do with punishment. We have no more fear of judgment because God didn't come to judge us when he sent Jesus. He came to save us, solely to save us. Uh, and he didn't come partly in anger, and then he, uh, he didn't come to punish Jesus uh, in our place. It's not, it's, not, it's not really about punishment at all. Uh, it's really about, as I said, about cleansing and expiation and delivering us and, from Satan and driving him out of us. And that's why he says perfect love casts out fear. Well, God is the spirit of perfect love. There is absolute perfect will to all goodness. He, does, he absolutely desires. There's no point part of God that does not desire your absolute uh, uh, good. There is absolutely nothing in God that desires evil for you. Uh, and, and that really is what casts out the spirit of fear. Notice, I, I mean, I feel I, it's appropriate to add the word spirit of fear, spirit here, because the term casts out is the same term that John uses uh, in, uh, I think it's John 12 or 13, now is the prince of this world is cast out. And it's the same word that's used of casting out demons out of people. 
And, and Paul, in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And so perfect love is a spirit and casts out the spirit of fear, the fear of judgment, the fear of rejection, the fear of, of shame, the fear of, of being mistreated, the fear of hatred, because we, are, we know we are loved by God and we are filled by the love of God for others. So perfect love casts out Satan. Uh, and the spirit of fear has to do with punishment. Well, what else does Satan do but punish people and condemn them and accuse them and, and uh, uh, continually uh, uh, seek to destroy people? That's, that's what we're afraid of. Uh, even, you know, when I think about just normal human relationships, what we're afraid of, of happening is of people rejecting us and hating us or mistreating us or uh, and annihilating us. And that's the fear that has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So if we're living from, from that kind of fear, then we're not really yet perfected in love. We're not yet at the point of expressing the love of God. Uh, now, we might have feelings of fear, and Satan can certainly tempt us uh, with feelings and thought, fearful thoughts. Uh, but uh, living from that as if it were the reality means that you're not really expressing the love of God. Uh, but in fact, what John says is that we love because he first loved us. Because God first loved us and Jesus first loved us in going to the cross and dying for us, uh, because he first loved us, we, are, we now have a new spirit that he has put into us that causes us to love the way he loves. And that that because his love on the cross, the whole point of it wasn't just to appease the father's wrath. The whole point of it was to cast the spirit of fear out of us and to put in us into us a new spirit of love. So he, his love for us on the cross directly causes us to love the way that he loves. He reproduces himself in us. Uh, and so we really do love because he first loved us. It's not we ought to love because he first loved us or we're obligated to love because he first loved us. That would just be mere law. No, we actually do love because his love for us cast out the spirit of fear and put the spirit of love into us. So if anyone says, I love God and they hate their brother, they are a liar. So it's impossible to really to hate uh, uh, your brother, unless, of course, you're deceived as to who you are. If you don't know who you are, uh, then, then you can hate your brother, or you can, Satan can hate your brother through your flesh, because you're not aware that you are loved now as God is loved. And you're a liar. You're really, you're not just lying to others. You're lying to yourself when you hate someone. Uh, and so the one who, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. See, we, we have to love, uh, we have to love the forms that God manifests himself through. Uh, and that's really how we love God, is by loving uh, the people, the, the, the sons of God, that he now manifests himself through. So this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And we can take that must out, and, and whoever loves God will also love his brother, because if you're seeing God rightly, and you're seeing yourself rightly, then you'll see your brother rightly, and you'll want to lay down your life for your brother, because you will see God in them. Uh, 
you'll see them as a manifestation of God in human form. Uh, not that we're exactly the same as Jesus. Jesus is, of course, the unique manifestation of the Son of God and is the only eternal Son of God, but we are, we are conformed to his image. We are images of his Son. So uh, because we are joined to the Son of God, uh, we are, he is the firstborn among many brothers. Uh, and so as the Father loves the Son, so now the son through us loves the son in all in everyone else. Uh, so I will uh, unmute everyone and we can talk about it or talk about anything else. I love you, Brett. What's that? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love you too. And that was Brett. really God telling me that he loves me through Mike. <laughs> Someone was going to speak. Yeah, um, I really like how what you were saying is uh, it goes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago in um, mm -hmm. chapter three, verse eight, uh -huh. no, eight or oh nine. Uh huh. Was that? No, that's still eight. Yeah, eight B. Okay. I, I love that verse. I mean, if you were to ask, you know, people at my church, why, mm -hmm. why did Jesus, why did God send Jesus into the world? Mm -hmm. It would be, you know, to forgive us of our sins. Mm -hmm. But I love how this verse says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. What, what purpose? To destroy the works of the devil. Right. <laughs> yeah and what works are those the deeds we did <laughs> right not other some other things that he did in some other realm i mean you know but what he does through people <laughs> that's mad at uh-huh yeah and what's amazing is how that verse is just sort of skipped over, you know, I mean, theologies don't deal with it. I mean, maybe in commentaries, they sort of deal with it on the surface, but then it doesn't really affect what they teach and believe. Uh, yeah. First John 4.17, SCA, so are we in this world. Yeah. This is kind of a sig signature verse for the union. Group, Absolutely. Right? It's kind of <laughs> right. the Galatians 2.20 verse. Yes, it is. Yeah. As he is, so also are we. Wow. Now, what would just the regular evangelical person say about that verse? Well, maybe that in this world, ideally, we're like Jesus. I don't know. I... They, they'd probably say something like, well, that's our position, but not our position. Right. That's, that's I hear that way too much. Yeah, uh, it drives me crazy. Or, or that's how God sees us in Jesus. 
it's right. Like, yeah, it's not how we see ourselves. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like, not how we really are. Right. We know better than God. There we see ourselves yeah. differently than how God does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Right. Why don't we dare to say of ourselves what God says of us? I mean, that's, um, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Scary thought. Yeah. That would be believing the truth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That would be Kierkegaard's leap of faith. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that could set you free. Uh, yes. But maybe we don't want people to be too free because then they might not come to church and tithe every week and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And we might not have 10,000 people in our church. They might go off on their own ministries or something and we don't want that uh, no <laughs> right nobody here knows anything about that no <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah and i know not all churches are like that you know i know that you know many churches you know, they just want you to come because they love having you there and they're not really pushing the tithing, but some do. <laughs> some are manipulative yeah. that way. Uh, yeah. Southeast used to give us the stewardship sermon twice a year. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. That uh -huh. says it was actually more than that. I don't know twice, how many twice times. <laughs> yeah. Well, you sort of got it every time the collection plate passed. I mean, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Under your nose. <laughs> yeah. And if you didn't put something in, you know, they'd sort of shake it. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how many times in the Assemblies of God we had the tithing sermons, but I, I it was often enough that I remember them 40 years later. Uh, and, uh, yep. and, 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 and offerings were above your tithes. T the first 10%, oh, yeah. that was the absolute obligation. But beyond that was offerings. <laughs> yeah, the 10% was the minimum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. were chintzy if you only gave 10%. <laughs> right. South, Southeast used to say that they uh, they did preach the tithing sermons because they did preach the entire word of God. Yeah. 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 Old covenant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. And there was a purpose to the tithing in the Old Covenant because the Levites didn't yeah. have land of their own and they had to be supported. The priests had to be supported. There had to be animal sacrifices. We don't have any animal sacrifices. So, uh, you know, that there's it, that's why New Testament never talks about it. We don't have a temple to support. We know we have building programs we have to pay for. And that was beyond yeah. tithes and offering, building fund. That was a third thing. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Southeast only has nine campuses now. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Well. So I I do every bit of that. So huh. is that wrong? Is that no, nope, not wrong. <laughs> It's perfectly fine to, to give as long as you give with a cheerful heart and it's what you want to do. That's perfectly fine. It's more the sense of being feeling guilted into doing it that than the doing of it. It's it's the we took the guilt out of it and Linda sent it in in the mail. Uh-huh. No. Or no, she put an envelope in the box, in the plate. I forgot about that. 
<laughs> I just sloughed my responsibility off onto her. <laughs> Yeah. This this aspect of love, right? For mm -hmm. normal, it was a big thing, right? Absolutely. As opposed to the cross, right? Okay. His emphasis was on God's love, which many people sort of shy away from. Mm -hmm. right. Well, love is supremely expressed in the cross uh -huh. and yeah. self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every time he uses the word love, it's it the cross is implied. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, like we as Christians, well, we are <clears throat> we have the indwelling Christ, and love is a very important feature for us, right? Sure, sure. Very important feature. Otherwise, you might as well might as well not be a Christian, like you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Norman was uh, right on with uh, his teaching. Absolutely, I believe that. Uh, and really, with regard to tithing, uh, that. It's really that a hundred percent now belongs to God, and we sacrifice everything for God, and so it's not just ten percent. Uh, it's it's really a hundred percent, and and God decides in us and through us how He's going to sacrifice that, uh, and how He's going to benefit others with it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I believe that's true too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. You can do nothing without Jesus. Uh, right. Yeah. You haven't attained any skill worth. Yeah. It's not paid for without Jesus. You don't. Right. You, you don't do anything that wasn't a gifted to you. Right. Actually, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. It profits yeah. nothing. Well, that's so, you know, you could sacrifice, Satan could sacrifice as you, but it not be from love. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the part where it says the, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, like it says... Yeah. Give as God has blessed you, right? Sure, sure. So it's, it's just common sense. It's ten percent. The first earlier years as the assembly of God, like what they call uh, Pentecostal uh -huh. assemblies, I used to be one of the counters. I used to write up the deposit, uh -huh. count all the offering, and some of those guys were big tithers. Uh huh. And the elder who was in charge would say, "Oh, let's see who loves God now." <laughs> <laughs> With the tithing, so oh. I'm, well, I'm well acquainted with that. Uh, with that, you know, the, the talk that they had. Yeah. 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 Well. The point is to give if you want to give, and if you have Christ in your heart, you'll want to. Yeah, but. Mind you, a lot of sort of charismatic or Pentecostal persuasion. Uh -huh. They are very generous people, I must say. Very, yeah. very generous. Sure. And some sure. of these conservative for Christians are very like miserly, you know. Uh -huh. So you, you can't just, just write them off. But it's just the emphasis was tithing, tithing. It's, it's, a, sure. big, it's a good thing, though. But, uh, yeah. you know, some people cannot afford, you know, Right. Oh, sure. Sure. God knows the heart. Yeah. Um, yeah.
Yeah, that's that's been my experience is is I just listen to what God says and and because He knows my finances uh-huh. better than I do, um, and He He asked me. I mean, I just get you know I support certain uh, ministries or people, whatever, and I just do what He tells me to do, and I give whatever He tells me to give, and, and when I supposed to give it, and you know all the ins and outs or whatever all that entails, and that makes it really simple because then I don't have any control of it. I just uh-huh. do what he tells me. And, and I know then my finances will be okay. Cause he's looking after them all anyway. Right. Um, turns out I can't look after them, <laughs> but we won't get into all of that. Right. Uh, unless you want to send me a, a check, but uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. So, so just allow him to do it. whatever he says is, what should be done yeah yeah well bob how do you hear that how do i what how do you hear his voice i know that's pretty fundamental but i've been stressed out this week trying to figure that out oh well i just hear him Uh, (laughs) i mean i i don't i can't tell you how that happens uh but I just, I hear them and it's very clear. It's very precise. It's not, you know, um, I mean, here, and one example, just to give you an example was I was going to start on a Bible study um, uh, online and God just told me before I even heard anything or knew anything about the ministry or the guy on God just says, I want you to give a certain amount every month, you know, like one of those automatic things. And so I just did it. That was about two and a half years ago and I'm still there and, you know, still enjoying it. And the guy doesn't even teach what I believe, but he does teach some, uh, Ashley knows him. He's from, uh, uh, from the Jewish perspective, he, he was born and raised a Jew in Jerusalem. And uh, so he teaches a lot. I don't listen much to his New Testament stuff anymore. That's disgusting. But his Old Testament uh, knowledge, because of his Jewish faith, he was a Jew till he was about 33 years old and then became hmm. a believer. And uh, so, but God told me to support him. So I support him. Don't even agree with his doctrine. He's got lousy doctrine. <laughs> not even what's true. His, and what's his what's his name? Because I've been listening to a Jewish Gideon, teacher. Gideon okay. Gideon Levitam. Different L E V Y T A M. Different different yeah. person. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Great teacher well, that, and has a uh, huge zeal for the word of God. But uh yeah, his New Testament doctrine is terrible. <laughs> so while so you, the, the the first john says test the spirits so so if you have uh, a thought and you test the spirit is this is this the holy spirit or the spirit of error trying to mm. coax me into something yeah and right. uh the holy yeah. spirit doesn't tell you anything that doesn't build you up or edify your faith so, so you, you right. know that's him so mm. so then you then you get more attentive to yes lord what is it what what are we doing what do we what do you want what do you want to do mm-hmm. and and yep. whatever circumstances you're having to be standing in front of so that's the way i hear them is yeah. i hear mm. what kind of spirit speaking to me and if it's the holy spirit then i'm attentive to, to think okay what are we doing here lord hmm. that's helpful and if you if you're born again that spirit's going to be the holy spirit not the spirit of error right for right. me almost every morning the, the holy spirit speaking to me when i wake up telling <laughs> me something mm. and on days when it doesn't happen i think 
I don't want to be thinking about whatever dream I had or what things <laughs> talk to me. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, as uh, Mom was saying, this this particular uh, sect or group, right? They say a Christian has a sin, sin nature. Uh huh. When Adam sinned, we got that sin nature. Okay. If you say you don't have a sin nature, it means you're sinless. That's the, on the other hand, that also makes a lot of sense, right? Well, yeah, they're, I, I understand where they're coming from, you know, that that's what most Christian groups say, that, well, mm -hmm. when Adam sinned, we all inherit a sin nature uh, or a sinful nature. Uh, and you know, I, I'm sure that that gets confirmed to them in their experience all the time, uh, every day, because usually people that say that say they sin every day. Uh, yeah. And to me, it's like, no, it's because of Adam. Adam delivered us over in captivity to Satan to dwell in us and to rule over us. And it's really Satan who is the sin nature, and he gets cast out of us, you know, when we believe in Christ. Uh, so we don't continue to have a sin nature. Uh, that that problem's been dealt with, but Satan can lie to us and operate through us. If we don't know that, that he's been cast out, then he can operate us from outside by, you know, attaching little strings to us and operating us like a marionette. But he's not really in us. Uh, he's he's just attached his strings to us. So no believers don't have a, a sin nature. Yeah, uh, because uh, uh, this is what they call Plymouth Brethren, John Darby, John Nelson Darby, right? Yeah. William yeah. Kelly and all those guys, mid nineteenth yeah. century, right? They came with all the you know like Baptist, uh, the Baptists and all that. They get all their theology from that. And they well, came you know, they, the, it goes back further. It goes back to the reformers held that we continue to have a sinful nature after we're saved. And they got that from the Catholic Church and Augustine, that because of Adam, we all inherited a sinful nature. So it's been going on for really for 1500 years, at least, this yeah, whole yeah. teaching, long before Darby. Uh, and... I think only Wesley really saw we could be delivered from it. Uh, 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 he didn't get it perfectly right, but he thought that we could be delivered from having a sin nature. Uh, and, mm. Mm. Yeah, Charles Wesley, he taught perfect love, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. An entire sanctification. Uh, yeah. But that's also a very hard thing to say because, like, you make one little mistake, sin is sin, right? Well, sure, you know, yes, I, I mean, I could sin, but that doesn't mean suddenly I have a sin nature again. It just yeah. means that I gave in to Satan and he temporarily operated me from the outside. So, really, my sinning doesn't disprove the idea that I don't have a sin nature. It doesn't really prove anything. Uh, it's not stated uh, it's not stated in the Bible that a Christian has a sin nature, right? It, it's no. all in the head, right? Well, they understand because it, well, Romans 7 must be talking about the Christian life because it describes my experience, or that's what yeah. how Christians reason. Yeah. And so all it says about the sin dwelling in me, so I must have indwelling sin. And yeah. this whole circular argument. Uh, it's based on Romans chapter 7. They haven't seen right. the final revelation. Yeah. And they don't see how they're oh. dead to sin. They don't yeah. see that sin is really Satan. And because they make this whole string of errors, they end up with, oh, we're still sinners, and we still sin all the mm -hmm. time. Romans 7 is the Christian life, and we still have a sin nature. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Romans 7 is actually, is actually uh, the independent self, which is I, me, right. yeah. ego, self, 
whichever way you want to call a it. A great right? revelation comes in Romans 7. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And really the revelation, and Norman taught on this, and I heard Brett teach on it when we had the day apart, but that's the very fact that defined by God, man never has a nature of his own. Yeah. He's an expression yeah. right. of another's nature. And yeah. that revelation just absolutely brought a lot of freedom to me and opened up really the whole book of Romans, but particularly yeah. six and seven yeah. to yeah. understand that what a vessel really is. He, he doesn't have a nature, not yeah. as God defines right. it. He's unique, one of a kind, as uh, Steve Pettit would say, never to be duplicated, but we still remain a vessel, a pot. Yes. And we are going to express the nature of another all, the, all our lives. Yeah. Uh, a person, and this whole thing, I know it goes back centuries and centuries, but it was never taught that man doesn't have his own nature. Yeah. Hmm. And and can I, since I've got the floor here, can I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I lost my connection, and I I got to hear John ask what I think is such a huge, vital question: How do I hear from God? And I got cut off when I heard Bob respond to that, and I just would like to make a comment on that. Sure, go for because it. Because <laughs> when I began to hear from God, I got angry. I'm going back a little over 20 years ago. I said, God, you said it right here. Your sheep hear your voice and they follow you. And it, and I don't know my heart, but you do. And I want to yeah. hear your voice. And through the years, here's what has progressively been developing me and hearing God's voice. And that is the obvious things. They're going to line up with scripture they're going to line up what mr holy Mm -hmm. spirit says and bears witness to us Mm -hmm. but on specific things and making decisions etc going to him there was one particular promise that i took that opened up this concept of hearing from god and it all goes back to faith and how he honors faith and how sylvia uses the illustration of a child that starts walking, stumbles more than he walks. Well, it is progressive. But the scripture I'm referring to that meant a lot to me, and John, this is for many, you, all of us, great question, is Philippians 2.13, understanding and taking the fact that it is God who's doing the willing in me. He's the one that is doing the thinking in me. His mind in me thinking, his voice through me speaking, every waking hour. And taking that and knowing that he's going to do it according to his good pleasure. So I took delight in the fact that I recognize, I believe it's Psalm 19, which is a promise that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give give us the desires of our heart. Well, the revelation came, whether... We, it's absurd, but the truth of the matter is, it's right there in the Word. Our desires are his desires. He is my life. He's mm-hmm. responsible for me. The onus is on him. He's the one who keeps me. So consequently, nope. as something comes as an answer, I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm going to trust God in that. But here's my point. I'm leading to this. I stumbled a lot, and the Spirit Mm -hmm. would correct me when I would make a decision by faith, and it wasn't always the right decision, but the Lord showed me it was always the right decision, because that was a part of the maturing and learning to hear His voice. It is all by faith, and so you trust Him. I trust Him to stop me. He has total reigns. He's the blessed controller of all things, including circumstances, emotions, my anxious thoughts, everything. 
But to step out in faith is the key. And if you miss it, you never miss it. God honors <laughs> that faith. So it's always stumbling upwards. And it and it gets to the point where you're hearing him in moments throughout the day, and you know that you know that you know. And you'll know when that happens. I wish I could say it's like a light turns on. Well, for me, it wasn't that way. It was progressive, just stumbling, stumbling, stumbling. But the Lord telling me, I never made the wrong decision. I stepped out in faith, even though all the appearance would scream at me that it was the wrong mistake. Now I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> Thank you. That Amen. Was cool. <laughs> so, Thank you, Rich. Yeah. See, I think we really do know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of, of Satan. If God's voice is always uplifting, it's always directing me to love towards the good of others. Uh, and the voice of Satan is always judgmental, unkind, you know, and so it, to me, it's God just produces and, his and desires in me. Go ahead. I said his voice is always, Satan's voice is always confusing, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, if God has spoken to me, he does not mind. I step out in faith, but you know what? He doesn't mind us waiting on him to confirm it in his word, in our spirit. And sometimes that takes several days, if not weeks. It just is the way he operates. And it's like, who was it that laid out the fleece and said, God, if this is the word from the Lord, then allow the fleece to have dew on it and the ground be totally dry around it. Well, you know what? God honored that, took him right where he was at. <laughs> then he doubted. He said, Lord, you know, Reverse it. have mercy on me. Can we do this one right. more time? Right. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, if the ground is wet and the fleece is dry, then I'll know I've heard from the voice of the Lord. And they didn't have Mr. Holy Spirit dwelling within them, confirming. Right. But the point is this. He takes us where we're at, and he trains us and teaches us. And like Brett said, it's gentle. Yeah. And it's approachable. And there is no confusion to it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, can, I, can I make a comment? This is Mitchell. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, I love the concept of uh, of us talking about how the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to you, and uh, I think it's just uh, with me and what my my uh, ideas are on it. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to me daily. As soon as I wake up in the morning. Sometimes very softly, sometimes a little stronger. But uh, it, yes, and there's a definite. Uh, you have Satan's trying to get in there. He's trying to speak to you too. But you know the difference. You, I absolutely know the difference, and uh, I love the. I love the Holy Spirit and the fact that uh, he's my he's my guidance and uh, direction for everything I do. As long as I open my ears and listen and follow, all is good. And uh, mm -hmm. I, it's just a thing to where what I've been hearing people say, it's a thing that uh, is, is, is different with uh, each person. But that's my definition of, of me and uh, me corresponding with uh, or the or the Holy Spirit corresponding with me, if I'll only allow it. Uh, and it's, it's such a unique, wonderful thing to hear these different descriptions of uh, how the Holy Spirit speaks to you and uh, and how you accept it. 
Mm-hmm. Want to just give us some comments on that? Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Thank, mm-hmm. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah. You know, I'm also looking at this, the verse, one of the verses we're reading, 418, there is no fear in love, and the fear has to do with punishment. And as I'm mentioning that fear is a spirit and love is a spirit and how what that to me means is that I don't have to be afraid of following the desires that God has put in my heart. They're his desires. And if I'm afraid, uh, oh, I'm afraid of doing something wrong. I'm afraid of getting it wrong. It's like, but I can't get it wrong because Christ Mm -hmm. is my life. He's the one living his life through me. It's his desires that he's putting into me and he is my keeper. And so there's really nothing to be afraid of because, you know, as, as Rich was saying, you know, even my stumbling around is really is within his perfect will. Uh, and, and so there's nothing really to be afraid of. It's when I act out of fear and I'm constantly having to check myself. It's like, well, is that right? Is that right? Is that right? Then I'm back under law and it's as if I'm living my life, as if I were independent of Christ. Uh, and and then, then it ends up being Satan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Rich Rich said that uh, really well, uh, you know, about the fact that it's faith, and and we just we take what it what what he gives us, and just go with it by faith, mm-hmm. and you you can't I don't think you can be wrong. Uh, it may like like again like Rich said it can seem like it's wrong, you know, in the end maybe, but God's showing us things through it all. Mm-hmm. And and so we just have to believe that it's it's from him and and uh, he'll look after it if you know if we mess up or whatever mm-hmm. and and it's funny because uh, and I think it was Mitch that said it's it's neat to see how God uh, is different with all of us because I'm not a morning person uh, the Holy Spirit never speaks to me in the morning <laughs> that won't happen because uh, he knows me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he speaks to me mostly at night when I'm awake and alive. And but what he does do is in the mornings, I spend a lot of time with uh, devotionals I get. And then I, I make my comments and forward them on to people that I'm um, mentoring. And I, I can't tell you how many times that there'll be something in one of those devotionals or in the scripture of those devotionals that that will confirm what he showed me the night before. Uh, because again, Rich mentioned, you know, he may confirm it a few days later. And it just it just pops out like it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. And it's done. And and then you know you're on the right track. So it is very interesting because everybody is different. And it, it's great to know that that God works with each one of us as we are. Um, because in the mornings, I don't understand anything except coffee. And once I get that out of the way, I'm doing not too bad. But other than that, yeah, I'm not a, I'm, and God, so God does. He actually, I mean, he works that way in me. He'll, after we're done here, I'll be doing some Bible studying and some reading and stuff. And that's probably when he'll be talking to me. <laughs> so, and I look forward to it because it's, it's so neat to hear from him. Even if it's something that's, you know, an explanation of a verse I've been, I've been pondering or looking at, and it's like, Lord, I wish, you know, I'd like to know what that says, and he'll he'll give it to me, and then it's just it's so beautiful to hear from him. I just love it, and a great way to live your life, just depended on him. So that's a that's excellent. You know, I've had uh, godly jealousies to some of the mentors and people that have expressed how they just commune with the Lord in their spirit all day long. And yet I've heard their real communion is in the spirit where they will not be aware physically, emotionally, mentally, even 
of his presence. And yet they're so secure. And that is, uh, I think Jesus would probably describe that as maturing faith. I'm not going to say perfect faith, but that understanding that he's He's there. I, I, I like I heard an analogy about this where mama is watching over her two children playing in the front yard and she's given them instructions and boundaries where not to go. And she's glancing out the window as she's doing her chores and she keeps an eye on them. And they don't hear wisdom's voice, their mother's voice at all. But as soon as one of them steps out into a restricted area, a street, for example, that they know, out comes mama, and they hear the voice of a loving mother. And so Mm -hmm. relating that, practicing the awareness and the presence of the Lord does not mean we have to feel and we have to hear him all the time. I mean, think of all the times we've been, some of us have gone through this, and God was in it where he puts us in a dark room, sometimes for months, some saints for years. And I like the analogy that we're all old enough to remember. If you have any understanding of photography, we understood that photography was quite a science that was developed before the digital age. And I remember a friend of mine talking about his wedding, and they were so excited, and his good friend was the photographer. And when they got back from the wedding, they were so excited to see the wedding pictures. So, because it was a time-lapse process, Mike, some of you may know I refer to Mike Wells a lot. This is who I'm referring to. He showed up, and his friend said, well, they aren't. I'm not finished yet, but I'm getting ready to wash them, wash the negatives. So he invited Mike into his dark room, and Mike looked at these negatives of beautiful Betty, and they were hideous. Every photograph was hideous. He was looking at the negatives, and his friend laughed at him and explained to him that there's a positive in the negative. And we've got to take the negative through an acid bath. (laughs) And once it's gone through its acid bath, that's a process of setting the positive from the negative. And then as it dries out, you'll see the positive form right before your own eyes. Well, Mike learned a lot about photography that day, but he came out and heard the voice of his father and said, and he reminded him of a specific very dark time he had gone through uh, previously where it seemed like the presence of God wasn't there, but he was aware of the fact that faith told him he was. And he said, all Mm -hmm. the time I was in that dark room with you, I am doing my own acid watch. I am in the negative. And in my time, I'm going to bring out the positive. I love the illustration because it does have to do <laughs> with hearing God and faith. Right. Amen. <laughs> and darkness. Wow. The passage that talks about God was always walking with me. Mm-hmm. I used to give an analogy about hearing God's voice uh, around, um, do you all like college basketball? <laughs> like in, in the playoffs, you know, what the stadium's like during the playoffs in a college basketball game. But during the game, the coach doesn't have to yell because the players know his voice. And, and all the all the screaming that's going on in the auditorium, they're listening for God's voice, and they know His voice, so they they're they're waiting on instructions from the coach. That's so true, and I can relate to that as a, as a college basketball player that sat the bench, but I heard the voice of the coach 
over the roar of the crowd. And the voice I was wanting to hear is, Stanley, get in for Kruger. <laughs> it never, or rarely, rarely never. came. <laughs> well, um, you know, I agree with that in having played sports as well. But you can also hear the other voices. Yeah. There are people in the crowd that will make a comment and it's not drowned out by the ambient noise as well. So you got to be <laughs> careful which voice you're listening to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, is that good. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you guys for saying all those things. That's really helpful. Mm. No. Don't get you straightened out for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Keep working at it, Rich. <laughs> uh. Okay, uh, this is Mitchell. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Oh. What Rick referred to reminds me of a story. Uh, I'm sure one of you will be able to relate to what I'm I'm trying to relate, but it's talking about a lady and and uh, as she's walking through life and. Uh, it comes up to the point to where she says, God, you're always with me. And then when I noticed, uh, and we're talking about footsteps in the sand, and uh, she's asking God, God, when I look back to see if you were with me with those footsteps, you weren't there. And uh, God's reply was, dear, I was carrying you at those times. <laughs> Mitch, if you could, Mitch, if you can receive it, we all love the story. But if you can receive it, there is a greater truth that uh, the lesser truth there yields to the greater truth. And the fact of the matter is, there never were two sets of footprints in the sand ever. Mm. <laughs> right. He, yep. he carries us exactly. through thick and thin. Exactly. He's our life. No. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> the spirit that's outside of you is not the one you want. Right. <laughs> when, when there were two footprints in the sand, that was Satan coming alongside of you, tempting you. <laughs> <laughs> it was Christ walking as you, so that's why there was one footprint. <laughs> yeah. And if you could, and if you can receive it, the temptation from Satan was a temptation that came against Christ, your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Wally, your son, Matt, joined us on Sunday, uh, was with us. Did he? Yeah. So. Oh, oh, wonderful. Yeah. I haven't spoken to him since then. So. Okay. Have to, he'll have to fill me in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. How's your son-in-law, Corey? Is his name going? Yeah, um, yeah. He and I still meet every Sunday to uh, talk about all these things that uh, we talk about here. Okay, good. So it's uh, 
Yeah. But he's uh, he's busy on the days which uh, you know, on Wednesdays and sure. and That's Sunday fun. we're usually talking. <laughs> uh -huh. Probably. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered if he was still interested. That's why. I, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He, okay. he's, he's really, uh, oh, good. really an excited believer. Oh, good. And, uh, he's a uh, he's into eschatology pretty big. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> it doesn't interest me much at all, <laughs> but it interests him big time. So. Well, it's okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Hey, Brett, uh, Mitchell here. Yes. I just want to say uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, you know, a new member of the group here, but uh, my goodness, I sure do appreciate getting, being, being able to be, be involved in, in mm -hmm. listening to your teachings and everybody else that has the teachings uh it's very invigorating and uh looking forward to the next uh the next time just wanted yeah. to put that in there that's all i got sure <laughs> mm. glad to have you do, do you need to mm. know where to mail your time I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. but, oh. lots of other things uh. <laughs> We we prefer uh, bank drafts for tithes, so you don't forget. Yeah, so just, yeah. Just, we'll fill in all the rest of the rules. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I I would I told you earlier that I'd been uh, reading material on how to hear God's voice. Uh-huh. And one of the things which uh was well, I'll read it. It's just quick. The indwelling presence of the Spirit of Christ is the law written in our hearts, which is the basis of revelation, and he has scriptures to back this, and the dynamic for the expression of what God wants to do in us. And uh that's probably where I should stop. <laughs> he has what do you think? I mean, it. Who is who wrote this? I'll, I'll read it. A guy named uh, Don Brzezinski. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know who he is. I, I really enjoy him. I, is, but <laughs> when he came to how you hear the voice of God, uh, he lost me. Okay. And, uh, so you, you, all the you people have spoken tonight are really helpful. Uh huh. And now I'm going to try to put this why I'm being quiet is because I'm going to try to put them all together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So anyway, and then he says, Christian obedience is listening under the voice of the spirit of Christ. Mm. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Anyway, I won't go any farther. I just, yeah. Uh, that's great any thoughts <laughs> i find if someone starts to confuse me <laughs> then it's probably something is off I'm, I'm not saying this is necessarily true of this guy don uh yeah. but you know if it you know to me the spirit speaks with clarity uh yeah. with confusion and so i just like well i don't get that I'll go read somebody else rather than, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if scripture confuses me, that's, that's one thing. Then I'll ask the spirit to make himself clear. But, you know, if someone else does, it's like, well, I'll just skip ahead till I find something that does make sense to me. Uh, and, no. Or it might be that I'm not ready to hear something that they're saying. And the spirit is just telling me to pass on it until I'm ready for it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tend to do that, but he, he's a real, um, yeah. 
student of Jim Jim Fowler, who right. I really have been blessed by a lot sure. of stuff. Yeah. And so I was trying to understand it and then I couldn't, but uh, yeah. Anyways, thank you everybody for, <laughs> for all the things you contributed because that's really, really helpful to put together what I've been dealing with. So. Sure, sure. Uh, Wally, <clears throat> let me expound a little bit on what I said. Uh, and I'm gonna use a baseball analogy. You know, these guys go into a slump and they can't figure out what's going on. And so they start trying to find the answers, listening to people. And before too long, they've listened to too many people and they got no idea what to do. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so I perhaps... Uh, and, and Linda said something to me that, that kind of struck this note is <clears throat> that Shane used to be with us for a while and he read so many things and listened to so many people. He was so confused. He had no idea which way was up and he left his group and he, this is the place he should have been to start with. And I just like that batter that has listened to too many people. We can do the same thing with reading and listening to people when, in fact, we need to sit down and wait on the Lord to tell us in his time instead of mm -hmm. trying to find out in our time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Ray. I've just been hoodwinked a lot by churches and I, it sure. drives me crazy. Here I am, you know, end of my life. And I learn all these things now. I mean, I'm thankful, very thankful. <laughs> well, maybe but, you found the root of your problem. Uh, I, no, well, yeah, I definitely have found the root of the problem. Yeah. But um, I, I <clears throat> I have difficulty just, um, maybe I have just difficulty just waiting on the Lord and uh, need to learn that. Do you feel you're just too invested? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, you spent so much time with the churches. Do you just feel heavily invested and you, we had, a, we had an old deal in, the, in the, well, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. <laughs> well, I've been in churches for, you know, 40 or 50 years, like a lot of you guys. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to find out that <clears throat> they're only getting half the gospel is a real shock. You know, I. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to get it right this time. And uh, really, mm. I'm at the right place to find yeah. that out, I think. Yeah. <laughs> They need you to tell them what the other half of the gospel is. Yeah. Well, I know, my, well, I, and I'm thinking I. That's why I've been going there occasionally. But it's so much about just doing things that. Uh, uh -huh. So no, being able to hear God is really important, and uh, you know, and I don't think Jesus lied that his sheep hear his voice. So. Uh -huh. uh, you guys are really encouraging in that yeah. the way you've heard his voice and your patience. I don't have a whole lot of patience. <laughs> none of us do, really. <laughs> no. Far from Christ, we have none. <laughs> yeah. You know, could I comment real quick? Sure. Uh, anytime, at this may not, uh, may not be uh, what you're referring to, but it's the way that I gathered from what you said. And I just want to say what I do when I get into a situation and I have some uh, questions or uh, say problems or whatever it might be, just uh, list those down and go to the Bible and uh, 
write down some concerns that I have and go to the Bible and see what it says and go to those scriptures. And <clears throat> it works 100% of the time. God's there 100% of the time. And uh, that's what I do. Anyway, oh. that's, huh? that's, that's my input. <clears throat> that's Mitch, right? Yep. So Mitch, do you, do you use a, a paper Bible or do you use an electronic Bible? I use both, but uh, I, I like the paper Bible mostly. The reason, I mean, you must search for answers. Right. If you have yeah. questions, right? So. Yeah. And literally what I like to do is I like to go into the you know, the back and look up uh, words that are concerning me and it'll give me a reference and, uh, you know, I'll go there and I'll go there and uh, good. Get, get mm -hmm. just great insight, period. Hmm. Yeah. Good suggestion. Thank you. You're welcome. I have found that I've read the scriptures enough, I guess, and I think many of us have, that the spirit just brings up scriptures to my <laughs> mind and i just i assume it's the spirit unless i have some reason to believe it's not like i suppose satan can quote scripture but you know when he's doing it because it's usually what, what he's doing is to provoke fear or condemnation uh but yeah. but if it's not that then i assume that oh god has brought this to mind why why else would i do it why else would that scripture come mm -hmm. to mind? Uh, and so that's ri rich kind of thinking, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing the scriptures he brings up that sometimes it's like there's absolutely no reason why I would think of that passage of scripture. I might not even have read it in who knows when I last read it and it, it just comes spontaneously to mind. So, so I know Satan's not going to be doing that. <laughs> no. Good, good point. Yeah. Unless it's something from like God destroyed them for their many sins or something, <laughs> some kind of passage like judgment <laughs> or something. Uh, that uh, happened really. <laughs> uh, uh. Okay. I, I know before I, before I knew any of this stuff, Wally, I, I was, uh, I was a church guy and, uh, and so to make a long story short, cause God always has long stories for me, but, uh, I went into a, a Bible class at the church that I never usually attended because the teacher was terrible. But there was a, a teacher that was visiting. So I just I just thought, well, I'll go in this morning instead of going to the library and sitting there waiting for my four kids. And uh, so I went in and this and this guy was teaching and he's teaching away. And I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever heard that before. He's teaching about the two trees in the garden and, you know, living from which tree and all this kind of stuff. And so I went up to him and afterwards and I said, where, where did you where did you get all that stuff? So anyway, he told me about a couple of books, you know, he said, well, he said, you should read this book and read that book and everything. So, okay, because I was a reader, a voracious reader at that time. And uh, so I read the books and I, I, you know, I knew in my mind there was something in there. I couldn't, I didn't see what it was. I read the next book and it was, it was a little better. I was thinking, oh, wow, this is, uh, yeah, there's something here. Never got it. I read the third book, still never got it. But because I read those three books and I knew there was something in them, I went to a conference and the guy started explaining it. Everything that was in these three books, he explained it in one evening. <laughs> and and just and when it happened to me, it happened instantly when all of a sudden I realized what it was. 
And that was, of course, he was teaching Galatians 2.20. And, and so after that, it was like I'd, I'd read, but it, it just seemed different because I, I never got it from reading, although I read all, all my life. And, but I, it was always something that God brought it to me that I would all of a sudden see something and things like that. So, but if I hadn't read those books, I wouldn't even be aware that there was something else out there mm. that I just couldn't see. And so again, uh, I, I can't remember now who said it, I think maybe Ray, but it's, it's all in God's timing. He knows, and I guess you said it too, Brett, it's, it's when God knows we're ready, he gives it to us. Yeah. And uh, and there's a reason for that. It's not because he doesn't like us or because we're, you know, well, this guy doesn't need to know that, whatever. God has a purpose in all of it. And uh, he'll bring you to it. I, I, I know he will. Yeah. I just know that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. That yeah. was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, it's Mitchell again. Am I huh? okay to talk? Sure. Well, you know, and that that brings to mind that the uh, the Bible it is so amazing. It is a living big big letters and all of the words of living translation. Mm -hmm. You can read a verse, we'll just say five times, and it's going to have a different meaning every time, and it's going to reach to your heart. Mm -hmm. And yep. you're going to hear a different message every time. It, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's the only book that I know that does that. And uh, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Amen, Hallelujah, Amen, Amen. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. That's because it's God breathed the, the yeah. scriptures, right? I find I get very impatient with human writers. And then it's like <laughs> I go to the scriptures and it's like, oh, okay. You know, it, it's like I don't have that impatience with the scriptures, but with human writers, it's like, hurry up and get to the point already. I, I don't want to read yeah. pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I don't I don't read human writers anymore. Uh -huh. I, very rarely if i do like hardly ever um it's just strictly the scriptures and and uh you know i mean i'll, I'll read a commentary but uh, right. not my favorite because you read 10 commentaries you get 10 different ideas and yeah. so i just rather listen to the spirit he looks after that and, um, <laughs> it's just so much better when you just depend on him uh -huh. yeah. interesting <clears throat> so while I tell him I said hello when you talk to him next, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll mention I'll mention that to him, Mike. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> hey Bob, how many years ago was that story when you, you uh, just related? 20, Twenty-one years when I went. Sorry, I didn't let you finish. No, I was just what? about about how long ago. That's all. When I when I got that revelation, you mean? Yeah, when you you read the three. Twenty-one books, years. So, Twenty-one yeah, years. Twenty-one right? years ago. Yep. Yep. Actually, the day I got the revelation was October the twentieth, two thousand and one, and wow. and I can tell I can tell you if I remember a date, it's important, <laughs> and it, it's <laughs> like it happened yesterday. So amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Hmm. Very good. Yeah. But again, God works different with all of us because we're all different. And he had to work with me in a certain way that he probably doesn't work with a lot of other people. 
just because of the way I was and the way my brain was and all the rest of it. And yeah. he just had to do it the way he did it. In yeah. fact, he, he six years before that, 1995, uh, was when he, uh, when I came to the end of myself, didn't realize that's what it was, didn't know uh, the time that he showed me who I was compared to his son. No condemnation in it, just mm -hmm. fact. This is this is what you are, and this is what my son is. And uh, first, that's the first time I cried in my life, and <laughs> cried for a long, long time over that. Uh, but again, no condemnation. It was in love. It was beautiful. But I didn't know what he was doing. I really didn't. <laughs> and um, I didn't know till six years later when that you know when that happened and uh, what it was all about. So, uh, yeah, he, he did it very differently with me. And I'm just happy that he did it at all because <laughs> I'm just incredibly blessed. I mean, every day it's just, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. <clears throat> yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Maybe, Wally, you should look back at all the past, I don't know how many, 40 years or something, you, 50 years you spent in the churches, not as a waste of time, but that was God's perfect process for you. And that's the way yep. he led you. And, you know, why he did it that way, I don't know. Uh, I don't know for myself why he did it the way for me. I mean, it, it just... I suppose it's the perfect negative for to produce the perfect positive in us. Oh. Um, hmm. Why did I spend 20, 25 years in a very controlling legalistic group that supposedly believed in union with Christ? And why didn't I get out earlier? Well, I, I you know, hmm. God was working mm -hmm. through it all anyway. So. I can't say that what God was doing was a waste of time or that he wasn't keeping me. Uh, well, that would be a different orientation. You're right. Yeah. I will venture. I'll consider that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all you can do. Yeah. 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 Well, to let you guys all go. 10 o'clock. Yeah. After yeah. 10. Yeah. <laughs> sure did enjoy it, Brett. Yeah. I enjoyed it too. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. It's he keeps always us coming back. Treat. It's always a treat, boys. Nice to see you all. Yeah. And I'm cer certainly glad y'all got to see me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. See you Sunday. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Good night, all. Good, night. Yeah. Yeah. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right.